All right, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. We'll be trying to move through pretty quick. Have you enjoyed this study on angels? Yes. Hallelujah. I feel like there's so much more, and we're probably just scratching the surface, but it's good for us just to scratch the surface. Right. says, uh, do not forget, do not, uh, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. I say that again, and I always, I'm, I've been opening it up now in the next couple of times that we've done these angels, is that just so that we don't get over spiritual, because the day's coming, and the day is really already upon us, because in the last of the last days, which is what we're in now, there's going to be seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And people are going to be talking about the unseen realm and talking about angels and speaking, thank you, Lord, speaking about angels and, and carrying on about angels and all those types of things. And, you know, going to act like they're more spiritual because of that. However, the reality is, is that everybody's probably seen one. So it really doesn't take a whole lot of spirituality to see an angel because they look like humans when you encounter them. Are you hearing me? So as a result of that, you know, if someone's like, oh, I see an angel, big deal, say so have I. And then they say when, not really sure. You say, well, then how can you say it? Because the Bible says, I've probably entertained one unaware. Amen? Or you can say, well, good. I've, I've entertained them as well. Are you hearing me? Okay. Uh, the Lord just told me to grab something, so I'm having to get to it on my thing. Okay. Um, so uh, we are not to worship angels as we concluded last week. Um, that's not our assignment, um, nor is it who you should worship. They worship God. We worship God. And so we are only to do that. Amen. Today, we're going to take a time to really just deal with one aspect, though I do want to say one thing at the very end, uh, but I really want to focus on this aspect of the angels, and that is the armies of God, okay? Um, <clears throat> we mentioned this last week that, you know, angels are like our secret service for us because they provide protection for us, but I want to talk to you a little bit about their battles, okay, um, because you need to understand just how strong the uh, the army that backs us is, okay? How powerful it is. Do you understand in the natural, a nation on the planet is as powerful as their military force? The ones who are considered superpowers are because of the weapons they possess. Okay? Okay. So you might want to know what weapons we possess. Okay? That way, I don't care where you go, you would not be intimidated. Because if, you, if we had a president that would not be willing to send our natural army to rescue us, we have a more elite force. Are you hearing me? that has the ability to rescue us. Now, I do want to say this. I understand there are going to be martyrs. Are you hearing me? So nowhere am I saying that you can eliminate your chance of ever being martyred. I'm not going to say that because many are become martyrs. Okay, not all of us, but many. What I can say, though, is that if you are not finished with your assignment, then deliverance will come to you if you are in lockstep with the will of God for your life. Amen. That I can emphatically say. Because those that were doing the will of God, and if their assignment was not done, God would always intervene their protection so that they could finish the assignment. Okay, all right, because Peter died a martyr. Paul died a martyr. However, John, <laughs> they can't kill the guy. They have to throw him on an island for a while, all right? And we're going to read out of Revelations. He's, there's a lot of angelic activity in Revelations. 
okay? Let's start out in Revelation 18 or 19, 19. It says this, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his what? Against his army. Now, he who sat on the horse is who? What's his name? Come on, what's his name? He's the commander in chief of the army. Now, I heard a uh, senator say this when they were visiting Israel just recently. Uh, They were being interviewed by a news channel, and they said, welcome from the eternal capital of Jerusalem. And I'm like, that is awesome. The eternal capital of the world, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the world. Amen? That is a true statement. So I just want to let you who are in branches of service that the eternal branch of service is the army. It's not the Navy. It's not the Marines. It's not the Air Force. It's not the Coast Guard. It's the, hoorah! (laughs) All right, just being biblical. So, for all those who did not join the army, you're going to be enlisted. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? Okay. (laughs) So, if you actually read this chapter 19, you'll see that he's coming back with those clothes in white, and you get over in Jude, you know the saints come, so we're a part of that army. I do not know how much conflict that we will actually be in or whether we'll just be a spectator of the show, uh, but we will be on the battlefield running with him and his angel army. Are you hearing me? Okay. So let's take some time to look at uh, uh, some of the weapons or how they function uh, in the earth on a military scale. It's very important because all kingdoms have a military. We are in a kingdom. And when Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave, he did not get rid of his military. Okay? All right. First example we'll see is in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7 through 16. And um, again, there's many places I could go. There are some you'll think of, and the ones that you'll think of more commonly is the reason why I left those alone, like Elisha and the army around him, you know, with the chariots of fire. I didn't talk about that, okay, because they didn't show our conflict. They didn't show what they did. They were just stationed, okay? Um, so we, we're looking at some other stuff. Here's a particular deal. God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. Now David has committed a sin, okay? He has numbered the people, all right? And David says to God, I've sinned greatly in that which I've done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done... Um, very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, who was a prophet, David's seer, saying, go and speak to David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foe while the sword of your enemy overtakes you, or else three days of what? The sword of the Lord even the pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Therefore, now, therefore, consider what answer I shall return to him, to him who sent me. Now, you have to understand something. Uh, I need to preface this conversation because we quote John 10, 10, and we forget about God's justice, John 10 10 says, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and, but I've come to give life and life, and we only think that God is giving life constantly. God is still a judge. And he, when he judges, he judges rightly. And a wage of sin is God is not a murderer. He would never 
eliminate someone in the planet or off the planet unjustly. In essence, they have been rightly judged. All evidence is against them, and God can act. Now, David is one person in Israel, and what was interesting when I was doing my Bible reading today um, concerning a particular king, um, Josiah, actually, um, he instituted the Passover. He said, it hasn't been done since the judges And that hit me for the first time. As many times I've read through the Bible, I'm like, King David didn't do a Passover. I mean, this is a guy after God's own heart. But he wasn't so close to the law of Moses that he kept the Passover and made his kingdom do it. But King Josiah did. Said, we probably, this hasn't been done since the judges. Yeah, very interesting. Anyway, so David's got this problem. Verse 13, David said to Gad, I'm in great distress. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So again, if judgment's coming, let God put it out. I'll go with God. And you know what? You should always go with God. I said, you should always go with God. So the Lord sent a pestilence. Who sent it? The Lord did. Now this is because of judgment. On Israel, 70,000 men of Israel fell. 70,000. That's pretty quick. And God sent an angel, here you go, to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity and said to the destroying angel, it is enough Now relax your hand, and the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor. Are you seeing this? Um, So then David, look at verse 16, lifted up his eyes, saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven with what? With his drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders covered their covered with sackcloth, fell on their faces. So this angel has a sword. If you continue to read this, you'll see that the Lord tells him to stop, put his sword in a sheath, okay? It's a very terrifying moment for David because if you go on down to verse 29, it says, for the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering, because David does a sacrifice, he stops everything, okay, through a sacrifice, but he won't go to the tabernacle In Gibeon, it says, verse 30, but David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was what? Terrified by the sword of the angel of the Lord. Now, David has been in so many battles. He has faced sword after sword. In fact, one sword he faced, he said, there's none like it, which was Goliath's. Because he ended up using it at a different time, you know, when he was running from Saul and he ended up, you know, finding the priest. And he said, man, all I got here is Goliath's sword. He said, man, ain't nothing like it. I'll take it. Right. But man, when he saw the sword of the angel of the Lord, he was terrified. Terrified. Notice one angel. One angel. Came destroying. One. One. God doesn't have to dispatch. And as we talk about this, I want this thought to hit you. When Jesus said, Peter, don't you know that I could call a legion of angels down right now? I want you to keep that in context. As we see the army of the Lord or the angels of God's army. The next one will go to 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 32 to 35. Therefore, says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come into this city or shoot an arrow there, and he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege rampart uh, ramp against it. By the way he came, the same way he will return, and he will not come to this city, declares the Lord. Okay? Obviously, this uh, king has been touting through his, you know, messenger that, you know, no God of any other... um, Kingdom has been able to stop me. 
Do you really think your king's, your God's going to stop me? You know, and finally, through prayer with King Hezekiah and things going on with the prophets, the Lord's like, he ain't coming, right? So verse 35, uh, verse 34, I guess I'm on 33, sorry. By the way, he came, yeah, verse 35, set four, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, for my servant David's sake. And that's a powerful statement, man. I mean, the Lord does, there's his mercies. Are you hearing me? Um, and because Jerusalem will eventually fall because of the immorality. Um, however, he goes back to his name and then he goes back to David. Verse 35, then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck how many? 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. Now, obviously not all were dead because men rose. The question is who died, right? Well, good news. Good news is because when you read the Bible completely, you understand first and second Kings, they deal with certain things about the Kings, but then you got first and second Chronicles that deal with information about the Kings as well. So turn to second Chronicles In second Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 21, it says this same context, same time frame, just a different writing says, and the Lord sent an angel who destroyed, who did he destroy? Every mighty warrior, commander, and officer in the camp of the king of Assyrian. So of the 185,000 who died, everyone that was considered a mighty warrior, the best, their best warriors, their commanders, and their officers, one angel killed them all. So he returned to his in shame to his own land, and when he entered his own uh, God's temple, his sons killed him. Amen. So again, we have in our kingdom angels that are tasked with assignments to protect. And our arsenal, or how they function, because again, you know, you, what if Iran gets a nuclear bomb? Big deal. I understand the implications if it goes off. But again, God has got some stuff that is mind-blowing. And what's crazy is God functions, it seems like, in primitive. Because it's like swords, <laughs> right? You know, you're thinking, don't go to battle with me. I'm going to pull out my AR. Well, you're not going to stand very well in front of an angel. Because first of all, your AR is not going to penetrate them in the first place, right? You'll be out of clips and he'll gut you. <laughs> Amen. And we could go through all kind of Old Testament uh, scriptures of how angels got involved, took care of things. Angels were involved in the delivering of Egypt and keeping them protected in the wilderness. In fact, uh, uh, the, there was an angel that would go before them into the promised land. And there's things angels were doing in preparation. It doesn't tell us what they did. He said, I'm going to send an angel to go before you so that when you go over, you'll, you'll take care of all the na nations. Well, what was he doing? Apparently, those angels would go in, much like we get a little insight when it comes to Daniel's, um, um, you know, question that he was asking the Lord and the angel came to give him a message but was detained by the principalities that were in the air. So apparently the Lord would send angels to go in there and start to conquer or to push back the spirits of those nations so that when he came in, they routed them. In essence, no weapon formed against us can, can prosper. All right? So God you know, sends angels in to help us fight spiritual battles. Yes. Right. And you're unaware of this. Right. You know, a lot of times, and there's some big error teaching, well, we're going to have to go wage war in the heavenlies. Well, you know, angels are doing that. Right. We are to walk in our authority. Yes. Yeah, are you hearing me? Now, I'm not saying that you're not going to pull down strongholds, which really that whole thing, pull down strongholds, has to do with things in your mind. Right. 
You got to pull, take captive strongholds in your mind. Okay. That's not out there. That's right here. Okay. But you can take authority in territory because, and we're not dealing with demonic, but just because we're here, there are places that are oppressed of demonic spirits that you, once you learn them or know them, you can bind them. You can take authority, but don't think angels aren't getting involved in that because you're not going up there and fighting because you would get whipped. Okay. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 12, let's get over into the new covenant because after the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus did angels quit functioning militarily. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. This is after the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod, who was king, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately, (laughs) an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. New Testament. I said New Testament. The angel struck him. Now, it doesn't say what he struck him with, but he obviously gave him something that worms ate him up. Are you hearing me? Struck him. There he is sitting on the seat, looks fine, but an angel's gotten in. So it doesn't matter about his army, doesn't matter about his, the people there there protect the king, doesn't matter about his color guard, doesn't matter about all of those, because guess what? The angel has come in, struck him, and left, and now he's dead. Hallelujah. Amen. And angels are doing this stuff still today. The problem is you just don't know about it. Now, I'm going to be a little hypothetical, but because the Bible, if this was real time, this was today, think of someone politically in our government that stood up somewhere to give some big speech. And then all of a sudden they died of some like crazy thing pretty quick. People would just be shocked. But could it be? Could it be that all of a sudden they were here, now they're gone? They all of a sudden were struck with this? They died of this? And we just think that's part of it, didn't know they had it, but an angel could have said, we're done with you. You're hinders to the plan of God. I have been commissioned to exercise judgment. Are you hearing me? So we are never hopeless is what I'm saying. I said we're never hopeless. We're never hopeless. Our hope is never in man. So it doesn't matter who's where. We have a responsibility to vote, we have a responsibility, you know, to engage in society. But at the end of the day, no matter what's going on, our hope is in the Lord. Yes. And we have things at our disposal. The reason why most of us don't, the, the church as a whole is not functioning this way is because all they want to do is know where they're going to go when they die. They're never engaged in any of this to understand it because they're like, it's too, I, I could never understand it. You, what? You have no faith that you can understand. God wants you to understand. God wants you to know his kingdom. Because you may be the one that God is asking to declare and decree a thing or to send a ministering spirit on behalf of the kingdom of God. Are you hearing me? All right, let's get into Revelation. Revelation's got a lot. This will be fun. Revelation 7, 1 and 2. And this, this is kind of cool because we talked about this last week a little bit about uh, turbulence, right? Okay. Then after this, I saw four angels. How many? Four Four standing at the four corners of the earth. (laughs) I love this. This is where the people, the earth is flat. 
because they use this all the time. You know, it's got corners. Okay. So funny. So funny. Okay. Uh, there are four directions. In any given, there's a north, south, east end. Okay. So they're at the four corners of the earth. All right. What are they doing? Holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. <laughs> These four angels have the power to control wind, jet streams. Are you seeing this? But not only that, let's go on. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. So this is a different one, not the four that are taking care of the wind. Having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to those four angels to whom it was granted. Now what's it granted them? To harm the earth and the sea. So again, they have within their arsenal through wind to do some things. Are you hearing me? Now, again, we've heard this say a lot of times, especially in, in the natural when it comes to insurance. If you happen to have something happen, well, it's an act of God, right? And you're like, is it really all an act of God? And why do we say that? Because the enemy comes to steal and destroy, and he comes to give life and life. Well, first of all, not everything's an act of God because the earth itself is in travail, the Bible's very clear about that because of the sin being dumped on it. Again, you got to go with the scripture. The, the Lord himself tells Abram or Abraham, I don't know if he was in covenant or not, but Abram or Abraham, wherever he was at in the time frame that he says this, he shows him the land that he's going to give to his ancestors that he's, you know, roaming around. He said, I'm going to give this to you. He said, but not at this point because the sin of the Amorites have not come to its fullness, meaning they've not disobeyed and dumped so much in this part of the earth that I will evict them for their disobedience. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So there's some things that get down and it says that even the earth cries out for redemption. All right. So does the, can the enemy engage in some activities with weather? Most likely. However, we know the Lord can. And in Revelation, he gets really into dealing with stuff on the planet. Things that are going to be acts of God and the world will know God sent it. Are you hearing me? So this is why, again, I say when I get on a plane, I'm like, Minister Spirits, go ahead, prepare the way so that I have no rough air. Right? I have no rough air so that we're heading in a direction we can get there with P. I give charge over this plane for the sake of the gospel of the kingdom. And I, you know, and everyone on the plane now, I'm going to take the responsibility to pray protection over their lives. Most people get on a plane and think it's just, and they don't know I'm praying for them. But they're going to find out one day. The Lord's like, you would have died here if this guy wouldn't have been on the plane. You'd have died if that woman wouldn't have been on the plane. If this person wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been praying. Are you hearing me? Because you understand, some people are in places that all kind of stuff is pull. They pull death to them. Because the wage of sin is, they pull death. It just keeps showing up. If you're around somebody that seems like they're always around death, you mean to be like, bro, what's your life like? I mean, why are you attracting it? Because you'll pull it. This is why you, when you look at cities whose policies are against the kingdom, they will attract destruction. Crime will be more. Flooding will be more. Hurricanes or tornadoes will be more prevalent in those locations. Okay. Let's look at Revelation 16. I just, we just got to read the whole chapter because it's just so amazing, okay? Look at this. Then I heard a loud voice. <laughs> this is, now, this is during the tribulation, okay? All right? It's catching away. The church is done. This is the wrath of God. This is the wrath of God. So, again, when you see the billboards, God's not mad at you. He is storing up wrath now. 
That's happening. And he's storing it up for somebody. So somebody is being applied to his wrath. Now you can avoid it because he's met the condition for you to get out of his wrath. Love did that. Love met the condition for you to get out of his wrath. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, seven of them now, go and pour out on the earth the seven. These bowls will make a nuclear bomb look like child's play. You want a nuclear bomb to go off instead of a bowl being poured out. Are you hearing me? I mean, seriously, you need to understand these bowls are a massive weapon. The seven bowls of the, they're called the wrath of God. (coughs) Let's go on. Verse two. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. Now, when he does this, look what happens. It became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worship his image. In essence, a virus took over everyone with the mark of the beast. A plague. Right? So when he pours that out, all of those individuals are affected by it. It doesn't matter where you're at. He releases it in the atmosphere and it finds you. Number two, verse three, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of dead men. Man, and every living thing in the sea, what? Died. It reminds me of that uh, movie, um, oh, Sahara. Anybody see the movie Sahara? And say, here, you know, they had that little, you know, leakage that was happening um, because uh, some nuclear waste was going to get in the water supply. And then when it supposedly, if it hit the ocean, then it's going to be catastrophic. <laughs> it's a bowl. <laughs> and they can't stop it. All right. The second angel will do that. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into rivers and springs of water and they became blood. So he's got a light weapon, but in a different geographical water supply. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, look what they said. Righteous are you. You are who uh, who are and who were, O holy one, because you judged these things. Look at that, verse six. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. We have lived, now, please understand me properly. We have lived in this thought so long that it's difficult for believers to even get over into a place of God in this aspect where if we just don't want anyone to get anything, but yet somebody's getting something and they'll get it because they deserve it. And you start to feel guilty. Well, man, they deserve that. Well, you know, but do they deserve it? Because again, especially when you know how many times someone has had an ability, the ability to not be in the position they're in, yet they constantly choose to stay there. My point is, is that if you see somebody reaping what they sowed, I'm not saying you can't stay. Lord, have mercy. But at the end of the day, it's not ungodly to be in a position of, they deserved it, because God is righteous. Now, again, we've taken this grace message so far that we act like God doesn't judge in the New Testament. But we know that's not true if you actually read Scripture. He's done it in his church with Ananias and Sapphira. He's obviously done it with King Herod, openly judged at that juncture. I mean, he did 
crazy stuff like, you know, through Paul, blind and a sorcerer for a time frame. That's, I mean, that's, that doesn't seem like that's mercy, but he's getting what he deserves. He said, man, you keep making the way crooked. You're not going to see anymore. You're constantly disrupting the path of God. You're going to be blind now. And you know what? God wanted him to do that. And we act like those options are negative when what if it caused that person to repent then? All right, verse seven. And I heard the altar say, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And let me tell you this. If you ever take the thought I couldn't do that. You are thinking demonic. When you read a passage of God judging and you think, I wouldn't do that, that is a demonic thought because you're trying to put your thought above God's righteous thought. That is a demonic thought. The devil is on a path of deception with you that you can do it better than the one who cannot fail. And it's amazing because here, you know, in this life, I've seen it so many times of how, you know, it's so easy for people to say, don't judge me, right? However, so many are, the ones who say it are just as easy, quick to judge a situation with very little information. Or with one side and never get another side. And we'll just entertain and use those individuals because they want it to be what they're hearing. So they don't want to ask the other side. Okay. All right. Verse eight. The fourth angel poured out his bowl. Man, these bowls are bad. Upon the sun. You understand the reach. I mean, this weapon isn't even in the earth. He's able to send this to the sun. And it was given to it to scorch men with fire. That means the sun got global warming will be at its fullness during the tribulation. Can't stop it. And it's not the factories. It's not the gasoline, petroleum, and it's not, you know, cattle. flagellating in a field. This here is a weapon that's going to be used. All right, let's go on. Verse 9, this is good. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and look what they did. And they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent as to give him glory. When we think of the tribulation, most Christians only think of one person, the Antichrist, which is so silly. Yet, the tribulation has got some of God's most merciful moments. See, what we all don't understand, or or the modern Christian don't understand, is that the wrath of God is still the mercy of God because none of these individuals have, have yet been eternally judged. They're only being temporarily judged. And there's still an opportunity to repent. Because again, when we get to heaven and stand before the Lord, none of us are going to go like, yeah, he ain't all that. None's going to be like that. We are going to love to bow, submit. We're going to see him in his glory. We're, gonna, we're not going to challenge the throne ever. None of that stuff. None of that. Well, I just don't know that I could do that. That will not be a part of our culture at all. And God's testing all that down here. Man, you better weed out all your independence. You better weed it all out now because he's coming after it because he's not going to have any of that. I said he's not going to have any of that. Okay? And here's these guys. They have an opportunity because they know it's God, but they won't repent. Verse 10. Verse 10. Ma, ma, ma. 
said, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened. So here's that big, bad uh, government that everybody talks about is coming. It's going to give everybody the mark of the beast, right? I'm going to read about that here in a minute because everybody's like, you know, where's the mark of the beast? I'm fixing to show you a couple things about that. Um, but here's this, you know, terrorizing government of the, of the planet. And, and the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Wow. They were in such torture, they gnawed their tongues. Can you imagine being in such anguish that you want to chew your tongue off? And they, what did they do though? And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the river Euphrates. Its waters were dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings of the east, from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, now the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of the God of God, the Almighty." Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they will be ga gather them together in a place. In Hebrew, it is called this. Now, what's interesting is, guess what happened? Because God has done all these things for man to repent up to these, uh, how many bowls we've we done so far? Six bowls because they will refuse now, Satan says, I'll deceive more. And he sends out more of his to continue to strengthen the deception to the hardness of the hearts of humanity that is clearly seeing that God is doing this so that it convinces them when he comes, if he comes, we can take him. Because he's coming. The king's coming. I said the king's coming back. He's coming back with his army. He's going to show up again. Right? All right. Said they gathered them. Notice they dried up the river so that they can get there when he gets there. Bring them. In essence, the Lord's like, bring them on. I don't want them to be hindered. Don't want a bottle, body of water to stop them from getting to me when I show up. The seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. This is in the atmosphere. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds of the peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before the Lord to give her the uh, cup of wine of his fierce wrath, and every island fled away. It means islands are gone. And the mountains were not found. And here, listen, look at this. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Wow. Are you hearing me? Do you understand the, the powerful army that's in our kingdom? that serve our king, that obeys his commands. Nuclear weapons can be everywhere. You understand our army can get into every place they're hidden because they know where they're at and can disarm them. They can do that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They can disarm them completely. Nowhere in scripture 
Although there's talks about, you know, fire falling from heaven, some people believe that some nuclear bomb is going to go off and a situation is going to occur based upon that. Cannot tell you that. I can tell you that the Lord uses some other things. He sure could bring an asteroid down into the planet himself because God tends to use things man doesn't make. So I'm under the impression that we're not going to have a nuclear issue on a global scale is what I'm saying. Because God is the one who's going to finalize. Listen, man can't control earth in the context of planet earth because the earth is the Lord's. Sin is there and he's going to revitalize it. He's, we're going to get a new earth. But he sets it. He sets it. This is why you should never take fear of the things that are being reported. Because we don't live just in this natural realm. We have a kingdom that is beyond this realm, but in this realm. And we have access to angels that can infiltrate this realm and are in this realm right now that are working on our behalf. Now, I want you to see this. Because when I read this, I thought, I'm going to close with this thought. This is the tribulation commission. Now, when I say commission, what do you typically think of? The great, right? And who has the great commission? We do. We've been given the great commission. What is the great commission? To go into all the world, preach the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? We're to preach the gospel, but it's the gospel of the kingdom into all the world. As a testimony, then the end will come. And that great commission is to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. If we drink any deadly poison, it won't harm us, right? Freely we receive, freely give. Praise the Lord. We're to make disciples, not converts. Are you hearing me? Okay. Well, there's a tribulation commi- uh, commission because the question is always asked when, we are, when the church is called up, who's preaching? Well, anyone left behind can preach. That knows. So will man be talking? Yes, will he be preaching? He will. But man is not the only one preaching in the tribulation. Angels cannot do it in this one. As we've seen, Cornelius had an angel come to him and said, send for Peter. The angel didn't preach the gospel. Peter came and preached the gospel, right? Are you hearing me? Okay. So angels are obviously talking to people to contact other people who will come and preach the gospel. But in Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse six, tribulation commission. And I saw another angel flying. Doesn't say he had wings. It's just Superman, all right? Which is really super angel, just an angel. I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having what? An eternal gospel to, to what? To preach to those who live where? To live, to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and, and, are you hearing me? So during the tribulation, these people don't have a traveling problem. So I don't care that you go to a one world government. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that. When the whole one world government comes and then they control all the currency and they control all the movement, the Lord's like, no problem. I got some angels I'm going to commission to go ahead and start speaking on my behalf now. Are you hearing me? God's not intimidated, right? Which means man is without excuse constantly. No human is ever at a disadvantage of knowing about Jesus, ever. Any human that dies in their sin chose to. And they'll deserve the judgment they're getting. Because love met every condition so they would not have to, but yet they still rejected it. So, Next verse, then he said with a loud voice, this is what he's saying. We're going to get a little bit of his preaching. We, get, we know it's preaching already. 
Fear God. Give him glory. So again, you understand, while seven seals, these things are going on, he's talking. And he's, he's having this conversation before the seven bowls. He says, fear God, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. So you understand when these bowls are coming out, it's not like they don't know. He's already been forewarned. Giving you an opportunity to get out of this deal. Because God's, this is why they know this is God doing it. His judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. This is what he's preaching. Let's go on. And another angel, a second one. So we got two preachers. Followed saying, fallen, fallen is great Babylon the great. She who has made all the nation drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. So he's talking judgment. He ain't going like, well, you know what? I don't want to talk about this, this uh, city. You know, I, I want to give everybody, no, I don't want to offend them. <laughs> he tells it like it is. Let's go on. Verse nine. Then another angel, a third one, followed them saying with a loud voice. I mean, this is a loud voice, people. Everyone on the planet hears this. It's like when you go to those other countries and somebody's driving in the car, you know, and they're on the speaker and they're blasting the neighborhoods. This happens in the, you know, Latin America a lot, right? And they're, they're preaching the gospel all the way out. I mean, these, these angels are going to be in the mid heaven doing this. And it says, saying with a loud voice, look what they say now. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So guess who's telling them not to take the mark? And Christians are walking around. Is that the mark? How do I know if I have it? <laughs> is the technology here? Yes. Yes, it is. And in this dispensation, you actually have the Holy Ghost in you. you you're not going to be tricked. Those who take it know they're taking it. But in the tribulation, they're announcing. You take it. This is what's going to happen. They're warning them. Has anyone heard an angel fly through and say this yet? No, so we're not in the tribulation. So don't be worrying about it. Right? Because people, again, what do they say? They say, well, the church, you know, not sure if it's pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. You know, a lot of people are banking on the post-trib. I'm not going to be here when angels are in the mid-heaven. I'm not going to be here. No, we are pre-trib people. I mean, it's throughout scripture. There is a mid-trib though, a mid-catching away, and that's with the two witnesses because they leave in front of everybody after they've been in the street doing all kinds of miraculous things by the king, and then they kill them, and they're like, see, we can take care of the people. We can kill people, leave them out there, let everybody, and they give them presents out. And then on the third day, they raise up. Now, why does that happen? It's to let them know this is what Jesus did. You understand, if anyone was ever doubting whether a person could be raised in three days, he sends two witnesses to prove that point. Think about that for a moment. They're preaching about Jesus. They're preaching about Jesus. They're preaching about the wrath. They're talking about they've been hearing all their life that a man raised from the dead three days, three days, three days, three days. The whole world's watching them. They hate them. Then when they die, they rejoice, give out presents, and then in three days, they raise up. And then they watch them go. That's two in the mid-trib. The church goes in the pre. All right. Then verse 11, the smoke and their torment goes up forever and ever, and they'll have no rest day and night. And those who worship the beast in his image and who receive the mark of his name. Do you see this? 
This is amazing. He's telling them, if you take the mark, you'll burn forever in the lake of fire. Don't do it. Right? Verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And when I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, say, says the spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. Their deeds follow with them. Their what? Deeds follow with them. A lot of, lot of martyring takes place in the tribulation. And they'll be under the throne of God. And they'll say, when are you going to vindicate our blood? Well, he uses that blood, so to speak, and pours it out in, in one of his wraths with one of his weapons. Wow. What you need to hear and understand is that we are in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And if there's anything we've learned so far about angels is that, man, we have on our side the force that could never be destroyed. We are the most powerful nation on planet Earth. We are. And it's so powerful that our kingdom is taking it over. Taking it over. Because it was ours first. Oh.